Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. My guest, his name is Dean Radin, and you study psi. Some of my colleagues prefer the phrase anomalous cognition because it sounds scientific. <laughs> but basically, <laughs> it, it's about psychic phenomena. Yeah, there's much more to lose than there is to gain in, in doing this kind of work. Almost every breakthrough was promoted by somebody who was immediately seen as a radical, as a maverick. And if they were persistent enough, long enough, the paradigm changes and absorbs the, the thing that was once considered radical, and science marches on. So, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. My guest, and I, I'll say it's a podcast, although I don't tend to do podcasts, I, I don't reach out to people very often. His name is Dean Radin, and hopefully I can show to any viewers or listeners exactly why I decided to reach out to him. And he's kindly given his time to explain some of what I believe to be phenomenal work. The reasons that I reached out are because, first of all, I'd like to say, although I'm not an expert in that many things, I'm an expert in reading people when it comes to poker and when it comes to energy in, in general. And I see you as somebody who holds integrity as a high virtue in your life, somebody who is intellectually rigorous, which is quite rare in the spiritual circles or the, the metaphysical circles. No, nothing, nothing against the circles themselves, but it's just a, a trend that I've not noticed. And I, I see you as, as, a, as a kind person as well, which is, is a really nice mix to get between the concentric circles of, of kindness and intellectually rigorous, which is also quite rare, I think. Um, so I, I would say that you are a scientist by trait and you study psi, I think you'd prefer to say, but I'm not exactly sure. Would you like to give an introduction on what exactly that is? Well, thank you for that introduction. That's very nice. Uh, so psi is the, uh, the first letter in Greek of the word psyche, which means mind, but in the, the broadest sense of mind. In fact, in Greek, it would also refer to soul. So uh, psi is used as a shorthand euphemism for psychic, because if you're in the academic or scientific world and you tell people that you're interested in psychic phenomena, they start backing away and then they won't listen to you anymore. So the history of studying psychic phenomena has gone through many different euphemisms that are used. Some of my colleagues prefer the phrase anomalous cognition because it sounds scientific, <laughs> but basically <laughs> it, it's about psychic phenomena. Awesome. So I guess that, so I, I think I want to kind of structure this conversation because I'm looking for it to be a landing point where in the future, if anybody comes to me and says, why do you believe in X, Y, Z phenomena? Then I can say, well, here's somebody who knows a lot more than me about the scientific literature that's out there, because I believe that the scientific literature is a really good bridge between the skeptic and the, let's say the more intuitive or the more out there thinkers. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to pose myself in this interview as, as the skeptic to some extent. So I'll try and ask questions that I believe that skeptics would ask as I used to be a hyper skeptic. So luckily this is kind of the language that I, I should be able to speak. So the first question is, I think the most obvious one, if there is such a large amount of scientific literature on the study of psi of kind of metaphysical or supernatural or psychic phenomena, why does such a large percentage of the scientific community believe that these phenomena are mere fantasy? Well, first we should say that the, the types of phenomena that we study uh, should probably not be referred to as paranormal or supernatural, mm -hmm. because th those are umbrella terms that cover a huge area. And so what, what I study and what the, the domain of parapsychology studies are things that are studyable. So what's studyable typically means you can bring it into the laboratory and you can test it in ways that are using conventional methods. So that limits what we can study. It means that uh, if somebody is reporting telepathic 
uh, connections with somebody else or precognition or a few other kinds of common experiences, those you can bring into the laboratory. And there are many classes, uh, protocols that have been developed so you can test those. So by comparison, if you're talking about the supernatural or the, the great unwashed paranormal, it is so broad that there are many things there that are simply not testable. So mm -hmm. as a scientist, I'm interested in what can be tested. So why then, uh, given just the database within parapsychology, where it's quite clear at this point that the, the elementary psychic abilities like telepathy, clairvoyance, precognition, and psychokinetic effects, those exist by all the same criteria that we know in other scientific domains. The reason why it tends to be rejected is because the, the doctrine that all scientists are trained upon and, and, and scholars, you go through the academic system today, you either learn explicitly or implicitly in, about materialism. So this is, this is the philosophical position that everything is made out of matter or energy, including the brain and the mind and consciousness. And if that is true, especially if you're thinking of it in terms of classical physics, like, like a 17th century physics, then somebody would say, well, obviously the mind cannot receive information from the future or from a far distance because it's all about the brain and the brain's inside there. So it can't reach, your senses can't reach that far. So that would say then that the, any evidence that you provide that says, sorry, there is evidence for telepathy and clairvoyance, they would say, there's only two ways of understanding that evidence. It's either flawed in some way, or it's fraud. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's impossible. This is what the prevailing opinion is today, especially for, for strong skeptics. They simply cannot accept the evidence because they assume that materialism is sufficient to describe everything. So to put any conspiracy theorists at rest, do you not believe that there's any nefarious underpinnings to try and quash specific scientific data? I'm not sure it, there's a specific effort to try to do that. I think it's more built into the sociology of science. Mm -hmm. That science, like any social enterprise, requires that you fit in. You, you, you kind of have to go with the status quo in order to get grants, in order to get promotions, to stay in the academic world. And if you challenge the status quo too much, then you are shunned and you don't get grants and you don't get promoted. So you get pushed out of the system. So this, this doesn't require a conspiracy theory. It simply is the way that any social enterprise will work. People want to get together and work together, but they also have to follow the status quo. Mm -hmm. And I, I, so I think the, that, Afti. The other element here is that as in the, the academic world today, uh, especially within science, there's a strong pushback against religious belief. And while Psy has nothing to do with religion per se, it's not, I'm talking about traditional religious ideas, there is an overlap between what people call spiritual and religious phenomena with these kinds of things, with psychic stuff, because just to name one thing, the Bible is a repository of psychic effects. And so it's easy then for a scientist who is very suspicious about religious faith to say, well, they're just doing this because they're looking for the soul. They're looking to support their religious beliefs. I can tell you that that is not the case. I, I have no religious beliefs. I'm not atheistic because atheistic requires that you do believe in something. I would call it myself agnostic. I, I don't know what to believe about certain things, including religion. My interest is based purely on curiosity. Mm -hmm. So at least the kind of work that I do and most of my colleagues do, it is not motivated by religion at all. And that's something I, I really do look for when I'm, when I'm trying to uh, purview different scientific literature. I look for people who don't have anything to gain for proposing their narrative. And I, I think that you actually, in your work, you've had quite a lot to lose, if I, if I understand correctly, by 
putting forward some of your more radical hypotheses or ostensibly radical, I should say. Yeah, there's much more to lose than there is to gain yeah. in, in doing this kind of work. Which, but this is not unique to the kind of work that I do. That if you look at the history of science, almost every breakthrough was promoted by somebody who was immediately seen as a radical, as a maverick. And if they were persistent enough, long enough, the paradigm changes and absorbs the, the thing that was once considered radical and science marches on. That, mm -hmm. That's how it has always been. So I, I recognize that historically. And as they say, if it's too hot in the kitchen, then you get out. Well, I don't mind the heat because I find that the topic itself, especially given that there's good evidence for it, it's really interesting. So I wanna learn what it means and more about what, what it says about the nature of reality. It's beautiful. I, it, it really is, it's lovely to see people who are willing to go through emotional discomfort for the thing that they are passionate about. And yeah, it's, it's, it's wonderful to see. So back to the skeptics questions. I might say as a hyper skeptic, so you have an extraordinarily, extraordinary claim. So you must have extraordinary evidence to back this up. So please tell me, you mentioned telepathy. What on earth could you have done to prove telepathy? Can somebody read my mind? Uh, no. <laughs> so the way that, uh... The way that we, we do telepathy experiments in a laboratory, we follow a number of classes of experiments that have been developed and refined over the years. So you can look at it both in a conscious form and unconscious forms. So there's one particular style called the Gansfeld telepathy experiment. Gansfeld is a German word, means whole field. And this came about because of a lot of folklore suggesting that the, the psychic experiences generally do not happen in an ordinary conscious aware state. It happens in states like dreaming and meditation, drumming, singing, things that are not ordinary states of awareness. Psychedelics. Psychedelics. So, so you, want to, you want to mimic that in the laboratory context to get as close to where people actually report these things and the Gansfeld state is, is a state that will put you into a hypnagogic condition quickly. This is the condition when you find yourself falling asleep and the, there's a mixing between dreams and awareness that happen at the same time. So the condition is very simple. You sit in a reclining chair, you get a ping pong ball, cut it in half and put it over each eye. So you keep your eyes open, uh, you shine a red light in your face Mm -hmm. And so everywhere you look, you only see this pink color. And then you put on headphones that play white noise. And if you could imagine yourself in that condition, can't, you're fully awake, can't see anything, you can't really hear anything. It's not sensory deprivation because you are getting input, but there's no pattern to it. Mm -hmm. And so in that state, after 10 or 15 minutes, your brain gets really confused because you're awake, but nothing's happening. So it makes you exquisitely sensitive to things that can arise in the mind, just like a hypnagogic state. And it's thought that that is a mimic then of these non-ordinary states of awareness where these kinds of impressions would be easier to see. So you put somebody in that state for 10 to 15 minutes, then you have somebody at a distance who will act as the sender of telepathic information. Now, it's important in this kind of design that uh, you prepare in advance what's called pools of targets. So the targets are either, most of the time they're, they're images like photographs or they might be videos, mm. but they're prepared in advance to have targets that are say, as different from each other as you can manage mm -hmm. and usually assembled in pools of four. So imagine four images that are very different from each other and you have many pools. So you randomly select a pool, you randomly select the picture out of the pool. So nobody knows in advance what the target is going to be. You give that to the sender in the experiment and you tell them to mentally send the content of that image into the mind of the receiver. So the receiver knows that this is the game but they have no idea what, what's gonna be sent. 
And the receiver oftentimes is asked to speak aloud any impression that comes to mind. So in some of the designs of these experiments, a one-way audio link is taken from the, the receiver who's speaking aloud and the sender can hear that. And so the sender can use the, what's called the mentation, the receiver's mentation, speaking aloud, to adjust how they're mentally sending to the person who's the receiver. Mm. And ju just to put the skeptics at rest, the, the, the sender can't communicate with the receiver in any way apart from telepathically. Right. So they're strictly isolated. Uh, in many cases, the sender and receiver are in electromagnetically shielded chambers. Uh, at least one of them has to be in a, such a shielded chamber so that you can exclude radios and text messages and all that sort of stuff. Uh, when we've done these experiments, we also check to make sure that vibration cannot be sent. Like you can't have one person jumping up and down and the other person somehow feeling that. Uh, we've used uh, a Coast Guard horn, which is 120 dB, that we would uh, we'd bla make a blast sound in the receiver's chamber and see if the sender can hear it. Mm. And the answer is no. But we did find to, uh, to our horror that it would, it would uh, cause the, the uh, fire department to show up. <laughs> they heard it. You could hear it miles away, but it wasn't, it's not heard by the, the person. It's the price the of good science. Yeah, it's part of it. So, so how would you then say, okay, we have found beyond doubt that telepathy can exist? Okay, so in, in one session, the sender's doing their thing for 20 minutes or trying to send information to the other person. Uh, after the 20 minutes, the person in the Gansfeld condition, the receiver, is taken out of that condition, brought back to normal awareness. You play back an audio tape of everything they said to remind them what their impressions were. And now you show, show them four pictures, one of which was the one the sender was sending, along with three decoys. Mm. As you recall, the pools of possible targets are as different from each other as you can manage. manage. And so the, the ch by chance, the receiver would select the correct target one in four times if there's no other source of information. Of course. Uh, by the way, the, the due diligence list that is followed in these experiments to make sure that there's no way of transferring information in conventional ways has been vetted by ma stage magicians who know all kinds of ways of, of producing tricks uh, and, and it passes their, uh, their requirements. Mm -hmm. As long as, as many other requirements that have come over the years that skeptics will say, well, maybe the, maybe the target that somebody was using was an actual photograph and they left a thumbprint on it. And so when they looked at it later, they said, oh, it must be the one with the thumbprint. So all of those things have been measured, like a dozen things on the list that could potentially be an artifact. So we don't do that. So at the end, uh, if you run many people through this experiment, you would expect a 25% hit rate by chance. Well, what you get after thousands, almost 4,000 such sessions is around 30%. Mm. So That's what huge. accounts for the, what accounts for the additional 5%? It's not any known flaw. And you run the statistics on this, you have odds against chance of being at 30% rather than 25%, which are trillions to one against chance. Mm. So just, just, to, just to explain that to people who, might, who might, not have, might not have understood that, you're saying that because they got a 30% hit rate instead of a 25 over such a large sample, that the odds of that being a coincidence are trillions to one. So either there's a flaw in the experiment or you have by the, the recommended scientific bar of what people say is proven or disproven, you, or you have proven that telepathy to some extent does exist. Yeah, we don't like to use the word proof. Uh, if science is about gaining confidence in data. And so we can gain, we gain high confidence that there's something going on. It's always possible that there's some flaw we never heard about. But as I said, after many decades of using these methods and getting lots of critical feedback on it, it may be, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. So all of those loopholes have been closed. And as best as we can determine, and as best as skeptics can determine at this point, uh, if you say that there's odds against chance 
of say a trillion to one. One way of interpreting that is that you, you take these the say five decades of many repeated experiments of this type, you'd have to repeat that five decades a trillion times in order to get to see the results that we got purely by chance. Mm -hmm. So it is possible, except that when you calculate how long that would take, it would be longer than the life of the universe. Yeah, so, I, I, I feel you. Personally, I would call that proven. And I, I think that it, it's definitely a good habit in the scientific community to not use that word. But for myself, if I were trying to create a worldview, then I would say either the experiment is flawed or it has been proven for myself. Right. Um, but I completely respect that you, you don't use that word. Yeah, no, we, you always have to maintain a skeptical attitude about what you're doing because it's easy to be fooled, Very either true. intentionally or unintentionally. So, so that what I just described was a way of looking at telepathy in a conscious way. So now we can look at it in an unconscious way. So the way to do it is where uh, we know from the neurosciences that uh, the cognition and um, the, the activity of the brain are closely correlated with each other, so-called neural correlates of consciousness. So that would suggest that if you take two people and you isolate them and you both, both of them looking at their EEG, brain, brain activity, that if you flash a light in one person's face, it, the reaction of the brain is very well understood in that person. But if the two people are keeping each other in mind, will the other person's brain change at the mm -hmm. same time? Is there an EEG correlation between two people? And the answer is yes. Just as you see in the, the, the Gansfeld telepathy experiment, you generally don't see it for sure in one session so you run many sessions, many repeated light flashes and so on. Statistically, over the long term, you find that there is a correlation between how one person's brain responds and another person who they're keeping in mind. This has been shown both in EEG and in functional MRI. So the functional MRI, you can see where in the brain the effects are occurring and you, can, you see significant results there as well. So there's a third category where you'd say, okay, if, it's a, if these kinds of connections are occurring in the brain, it's probably occurring in the rest of the body too. So let's look at other factors, like let's look at heart rate or skin conductance or pupil dilation or any number of other measures. And there too, there've been many repeated experiments showing that simply staring at the video image of a person at a distance will cause their physiology to change. So this is a, a formalized version of the feeling of being stared at and it works. So may I ask anybody that's watching right now to stare at us with only love? <laughs> yes. And it, because it is not entirely clear that this only works in real time, it may work retroactively as well. So future observers, yes, gaze at us with, with kindness. Mm. And a lot of my poker, uh, let's call them friends or fans, they will know that I'm, I'm very much about protecting one's energy in lots of different ways. I think that uh, there, are, there are a number of techniques that one can, to, can use to protect oneself from different kinds of negative energy. And you can say that whether you're next to somebody and you can feel that they're angry and you, you're a bit too empathetic, but you can also say that if you're a long way away from somebody. So whenever I'm going to do a public uh, performance or a, or a podcast or something like that. I actually have my own sets of, of things that I do. Do you, do you have your own kind of uh, side practices that you, you use to protect yourself? I wouldn't say that specifically for protection, but I do meditation every day. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I believe I get down to a calm enough state in meditation so that if I, if there were energetics that were not particularly pleasing, I, I just dissipate it mm. through meditation. Beautiful. So another question that I think a lot of skeptical people would ask, and it's a question that I would have asked as well, is that there's a man called James something, and his name does escape me, but he's created that if you can prove any of these phenomena exist, I will pay you personally a million dollars out of this fund. And a lot of people say, well, if you've proven it, why hasn't he given you a million dollars? Right. So that was James Randi, who, who uh, passed away. We're, we're speaking now in November 2020. So that was about a month ago. 
He passed oh, away. I didn't know that. Yeah. So what everyone in the field who knew what was going on in this case knew that this was a, a part of his show, essentially, that he's, he's a magician and he made his entire career debunking, as he would say, debunking psychics who are fraudulent. And there are people who claim that they're psychic or mediums who are fraudulent. Many, so many of them. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's, it's not surprising then that he, he could make a living doing this and that scientists would love it because they're, they're generally quite skeptical about these things. Uh, and so the, the million dollar prize is part of uh, a lineage of other prizes that have been offered over the years to do the equivalent of uh, prove to me right now under conditions that, that I will specify that you can do something which is a miracle. And so the lot, a lot is said over the years about uh, how no one has ever even passed the preliminary stages of this. But when you look at what people are actually asked to do, it's close to impossible. In fact, it's so impossible that it's not surprising that no one has ever passed. Uh, one time I was asked, well, what would it take to, take to do something like the Gansfeld telepathy experiment in order to get to the, the level of a million to one odds against chance? How, how much effort would it take to get there to, to demonstrate this? Because usually it was about a million to one odds overall. And the answer is it would take, well, about a million dollars to do that. <laughs> Just of the number of people, the time and effort, because when you look at four decades of research and a lot of people involved in producing the evidence, there's a lot of time and energy that went into that. It's, it's not something you can prove with a finger snap. And so the, the prizes that are offered are generally asking for a level of performance that you just don't see on demand. And remember, all of the experiments we do are asking somebody to be psychic on demand under the terms that we specify. And it's not easy. Even, even top flight psychics who are genuine, they find it difficult to perform under those conditions. But fortunately, they can perform well enough so that after lots of people and lots of repeated trials under very strictly controlled conditions, you can show that there are effects. Can I ask, uh, taking the skeptic's hat off for a second, more of a curious question. From my experience in the metaphysical realms, and I'll, I'll use that word for myself, I've come across people who are extraordinarily, at least ostensibly trained in, in lots of abilities that modern science would deem impossible. Um, but I will say that in the Western world, the people that I've come across have been not very good. Even if they have had abilities, they've not been honed, they've not been taught. Whereas if one looks East, there's actually people that have spent decades training, not specifically to just show off talents, but the, the power of mind, the power of intention. Um, so have you ever tried incorporating people who have gone through those processes into your data set? Yeah, I, I agree with your assessment that if the culture is supportive of these kinds of phenomena, then you find people who can spend most of their adult lives learning how to do something either as part of their spiritual practice or because they're a healer or something like that. Uh, in the West, it's much more difficult because there's a lot of pushback on it. And so you find that there are people who are talented naturally and they generally are not public about it. They have yeah, much I've more to do. I've met a lot of people who say that they, they believe in X, Y, Z or they're a, they're a healer. They read specific energies. I won't even name different things that they do, but they they don't see the point. It's, it's like a cost... Uh, cost risk analysis, whatever it's called, a uh, risk benefit analysis, where in their minds, they're better, they're better off if they keep it completely private. And I think that this is hopefully something that will exponentially turn as more and more people come forward to say they believe in these things. Right. So the, the other thing that I found in working uh, with Easterners, uh, one time I, I spent a month in India and I was giving lectures at various universities and one of the departments that I gave a talk in was on cognitive neuroscience. So I gave a talk about telepathy research to, to these uh, the mostly Indians in the, in the audience, and they were fascinated with it. 
and everyone completely accepted it. So then I, I asked, well, then you have all the facilities to be able to do these kinds of experiments. Don't you think that would be interesting? They said, no. And I thought, well, well why not? I said, well, everyone knows that telepathy is real. Why would we even bother to do that? So again, in, a, in the right culture, what we're talking about now is not controversial at all. In fact, it's so not controversial that, is, that telepathy is not even seen as part of the academic discipline of cognitive neuroscience. And so there are no dis- there are no departments out there that would be studying that sort of thing. So they just don't do it. And then you go into the in a Western uh, context, and people see it as so controversial they don't even really want to touch it. So you know it's some kind of middle middle world here that uh, you would think that scientists around the world would be interested in understanding how is it possible. Somehow culture modulates these things so that it's either seen as obvious and not worth studying or so controversial that it's impossible. So it's, it doesn't happen very often. And I, th- I think from the, the viewpoints of a person watching, I, I would say that it's easy for somebody to look up to modern science within the Western culture and see it almost as this deified presence that can be right almost always about when they say something definitely does exist or when they say something definitely doesn't exist. And I I would say that looking back through history, we've seen that that's 100% of the time, not the case. There have always been exceptions to the scientific consensus where 99% of scientists have believed X and actually X is, is untrue. And uh, I, I don't believe there's any evidence or any reason to believe that we're not in a similar situation now. No, I, I agree that uh, the tech, this is the reason why textbooks are revised every couple of years, because at the leading edge of what is known, nobody knows what the right answer is. And all of the really interesting science is always at the leading edge of the known. So when you, you're trying to establish what am I going to put into my physics 101 textbook or my psychology 101 textbook, everything in there at this point is very well established and is not going to go away. So that's, these are things learned after many, many decades or centuries even. When it comes to uh, the more interesting things in, in, in every discipline that you can imagine, all science is looking at the edge of what is not known because otherwise why bother just learning something that is already known? And there's an enormous amount of uncertainty. So when you look in the journals, you find people screaming at each other in journals there's somebody proposes evidence, somebody proposes an experiment, and they're, they're screaming back and forth. If you, I mean, this is in print, but that's what goes on a lot in, in the, the scientific journals today, because we're, we're all trying to struggle with taking evidence and explanations about what is reality and mm. what is the role of consciousness in it, and all of those very interesting questions. So, Science as portrayed generally in textbooks and especially how it's portrayed in movies and in television is as though we like we really have a handle, we know exactly what's going on. That is true, but for things that are now considered elementary, it is not true when it comes to the really big questions. Yeah, perfect. So moving on to, a, to another phenomenon that you've spoken about in your book, Real Magic, which was, by the way, thank you so much that I it was a huge part of bringing me away from what I can only look back and say was my delusional mindset of hyper skeptical nature of just doubting anything that wasn't in my my materialistic and naturalistic worldview so thank you so much for that it, it really it bridged the gap with scientific reasoning because it's really hard to chip away at my it was really hard to chip away at my skepticism without scientific literature to use as a a cudgel. Um, So one of the things that really stood out to me and stands out to me now was the power of intention and especially how that's then applied to the realms of mathematics. So as a poker player, this is obviously something that could be quite phenomenal. If for some reason you would be able to will the cards that are about to be laying out in front of you to be either you know, more in your favor or less in your favor, then perhaps that adds another entire layer onto the game of poker, 
which has been yet undiscovered. Mm -hmm. And I actually, I, I quizzed my Instagram audience on this maybe six months ago. And I said, who believes that this is possible, that you can change the, the formation of a deck of cards before it is even dealt or before it's even shuffled based on your intention. It was actually 50, 50. So I'm very, very happy with my, <laughs> with my very divided audience. So I guess, let me try and think of a question that a skeptic would ask. How the hell can that be true? <laughs> yeah. So there have been experiments uh, back in the days, and we're talking 50 years ago, when cards were used in these kinds of experiments, uh, very few people are doing that today. Uh, there was one type of task called a psychic shuffle. And, and very specifically, uh, somebody is shuffling cards and you wish for them to go into a certain order. And so would that work? Well, it kind of works. So how is it possible for it to work? Well, it presumably would require something like a retrocausal influence. You're, you're doing a, you're mentally wanting something to happen, but you're ha having it to happen in the past, especially if you don't have, if you're not, don't have any access to the person who's doing the shuffling. Sorry, just, simply, just to clarify, have they already shuffled when you start willing? Uh, they could, they, they could be shuffling as you are willing, if it's mm, a real time. That, that's what I thought. Also, of. it could also be in the past. They could have already shuffled it yesterday. Nobody's looked at it yet. And, and your intention now has the potential of altering what happened in the past. So the, the two explanations, if it, if it were shuffled in the past, would either be retrocausal where you're literally going back in time and changing that, or perhaps you're resonating with some energy that's already existed that's in the universe yeah, you, and you're picking up on that. You're probably not changing what actually occurred in the past. You are changing what is happening in the past. Right, so you almost you need to think more in terms of like a block universe, mm -hmm. where uh, something happening yesterday, from their perspective, is happening in the present. So the question is, when something like shuffling cards is happening in the present, what kind of influence could make it be different than it would be as a pure random effect? Well, the, normally we think about this as there are influences which only occur in the present. But that's an assumption. There could be influences from the past and influences from the present or from the future as well. In fact, when you look at it from a physics perspective, the, the issue of when things happen is not clear at all. There, there's, there's a time symmetry that can occur where things from the future and things from the past come together to create something happening in the present. So, this is not simply a theoretical idea. It's actually been a, a testable idea. And the way that's been tested within parapsychology is that you would take something like a true random number generator. This is a, a device that produces generally zeros and ones, but mm -hmm. based on a, some kind of quantum principle so that it's unpredictable. And you record a whole big batch of zeros and ones, but nobody looks at it yet. So you, you have it in a memory stick, but no one knows what it is. So you then, in the future, you already have the stick from the past. Somebody in the future says, okay, I want you to make the, the random bits go into a particular pattern. Like I want a certain number to go up and then a certain number to go down. In other words, give me a pattern. Then you play the bits back. So now this is the first time that somebody has seen it. You play the bits back and now mentally you're trying to change the bits. Right, or not change them, but you're trying to get the bits to conform with what the instructions were. So this is a called an experiment in retrocausation. It's a retroactive uh, psychokinetic effect. And if it's successful, you'll be able to show that the pre-recorded bits conform to instructions that were given in the future. So there have been something like uh, a dozen or so experiments that use that design. And the results overall show that you get not only significant results, but the same level of significance that you get when you do it in real time. So this would suggest then that a psychic shuffle is not something that requires the shuffling to happen in your presence in real time, but could potentially be something that has already occurred, except that the influence is somehow slipping backwards in time and influencing the shuffle as it occurred at that time. And this mm -hmm. is this is 
a subtlety, but it's an important one. You are not changing what happened in the past. You are influencing it as it occurred in the past. It's absolutely fascinating. I think that it's probably good to maybe reiterate exactly how the the experiment has has been conducted because I imagine that a skeptic's mind would absolutely explode at that. Can I can I actually ask maybe a little pointer? I or maybe I'll, I'll phrase this as a question. Do you think that how much the person wants to influence, say, the the deck of cards affects it? And if so, have you considered gambling? <laughs> Well, so there have been gambling type experiments that, that have been done where the uh, you can win money or you could try to win a horse race. And the, all of these things, of course, ultimately are based on random events. Mm -hmm. So the nice thing about a, an electronic random number generator is that in a computer environment, lots of computer games already use random things happening. So instead of using a pseudo random algorithm in the computer, you pull it out of a, an actual physical device. Okay, I think I have one over here. Someone over here, over here. Yeah, so here's, here's an example of, uh, of a true random number generator. This one's called true RNG. So it's, uh, the randomness is traced down to something called electron tunneling. So it's, it's a quantum mechanical event that's occurring in semiconductors. Mm -hmm. And here's another kind of random number generator this one is literally quantum because it is sending photons that hit a, a half silver mirror and sometimes it'll go through and sometimes it'll bounce off. Well, that's a quantum event, the decision that's made. So it's these kinds of devices that are used in these kinds of experiments. So it is true that if you, if you try to wrap your mind around how, is, uh, how actually any of these phenomena work, but especially retroactive effects, it can make your brain hurt. And, and that's said partially in jest, but it also actually will make your brain hurt after a while <laughs> because we're so used to thinking in, in, in a temporal form. You know, it's like our clocks keep going in a certain direction and we take it so for granted that that's the only way that causality can work. That when you're presented then with an experiment where you apparently can change what happened already, it gives you a brain ache. So, so I'll repeat the experiment. So you use a random number generator, you record a whole bunch of bits. Nobody's looked at it, which is important. Nobody can look at those bits yet. Then you have somebody in, you go, you, it's the next day now, you have somebody give instructions on how to influence those bits. And, and in the future, you will then look at the bits being played back in, in either a computer game or a simple graph or something, some way of looking at what's happening. And you see then whether the data conforms to the instructions that were given after the bits were already recorded. And when you do that, you find that statistically speaking, they are, they do conform to what was provided as instructions in the future, which suggests that there's some kind of retrocausal influence that again, didn't change what was recorded, it influenced it as it was being recorded. Hmm. So another question that often arises with something like this is, well, if nobody looked at the bits that were originally recorded and you didn't, you'd have somebody look at it and influence it, what if another person looks at it and tries to influence it? And then another and another and another. And, and this, is, this, this is a problem because when, when does the, when are the bits so-called collapsed into a form where they can't be influenced anymore? And the answer is we don't know because a lot depends on how you look at them. What is the form in which they are being looked at? And these are open questions, we don't know. But we do know that at least in, in the type of experiment, which is the simplest form where there's one person looking at previously recorded bits, or if you wish, previously shuffled cards, that at least one person can influence it. More people, we, we don't quite know. And it probably is something like an exponential decay or something like that. So one person can do it a lot and a second a little bit less and a third a little bit less. So by the time you get out to 10 or 20 people, you can't change it anymore. You can't influence it anymore. 
Amazing. So that's definitely something that would be extraordinarily outside the realms of, of many people's worldview. Um, so let, let's try and weave in some of your theories or hypotheses into how this actually happens. You've already mentioned the, the phenomenon that time is not linear, and that, that seems to be widely accepted by, or at least the, the theory seems to be widely approved by, by most modern scientists, that we, we only experience time linearly. Mm-hmm. And uh, time is maybe perhaps more of a singularity or nonlinear, at least. We, we don't know what it is. Who so, knows? Yeah, <laughs> it's a uh, thing. So I'm, I'm going to um, look up here, uh, ju- just for your own sake, uh, a, uh, a website which has a pretty good explanation about how this works. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'll put it in the chat box, which you can use later. Cool. Thank you. Um, This is here. So this whole site talks about this in great gory detail. Beautiful. Um, including, it, it gives a, a meta-analysis of studies. Uh, let's see, is it here? No, oh, here it is. So it's this page. This page gives the results of how many um, about 20 or 25 experiments that use the methods that I have been describing that shows that even though this makes your brain hurt, it actually is a real effect. And uh, yeah, I, uh, the, you're kind of preaching to the choir, but I know there's a lot, a lot of other people listening who, who will need some. So I'll, I'll post these links in the, in the description. I'll, I'll read through them as well. Okay. Let, me, let me add one thing to the idea of scientific skepticism. Mm-hmm. And it's completely understandable why scientists uh, will, will get that impression because they, they either hear it constantly and kind of just absorb it. But we did a, a survey where we asked the general public and a subset of scientists and engineers, not what they believed about this, but what kinds of things they had actually experienced. So we gave a list of 25 different kinds of experiences, everything from the feeling of being stared at to synchronicities, all kinds of things that would be considered psychic to see how many scientists and engineers and how many in the general population have these experiences. So among the general population, 94% of the respondents said that they had experienced at least one of the 25 and on average about eight. Mm. Then the scientists and engineers, 93% said they had experienced at least one of these events and also on average about eight. So the, the idea that scientists and engineers are inherently more skeptical because of predilections or because of training or whatever is simply not true. A lot of people have these experiences. What scientists and engineers do differently than the general population is they learn very quickly to not talk about it because they, they don't know what to make of it or they can't explain it or they want to be thought of as being non-serious or something of that sort. So it is not the case that scientists and by the way, academics and scholars, they have the same level of experiences that other people have. Hmm. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. Um, so I guess a question would be, if these phenomena like telepathy exists, then how do you propose that they are happening? Do you think that they, they still fit into the Newtonian physics way of looking at things? Do you think it involves quantum physics or do you think that there are other phenomena that modern science hasn't really tapped into? Well, the last part is certainly true. Science is not finished yeah. and physics is definitely not finished. Uh, the, the way I, I think of it is that we, we don't have a good explanation at this point, but if you look at the evolution of physical ways of understanding reality, that if, if you take a, a Newtonian or just classical physics in general, you take that as a standing or as a, uh, a baseline for how do you want to explain these things, it's really, really difficult. You then look at how classical mechanics evolved into quantum mechanics, suddenly we start seeing that there are some things that make a lot of sense. Like our, our better understanding of the physical world allows for non-local connections through space and time. Mm. And it also allows for observers to change the physical world as a result of observing. That sounds awfully close to the nature of these phenomena, that somehow we are connected through space and time and somehow our observation changes things. 
So th th it's important to then realize that quantum mechanics does not explain psychic phenomena. Psychic phenomena are way more crazy than quantum mechanics. But quantum mechanics in a historical sense is part of the evolution of understanding the nature of physicality. And, and that will continue, provided we're still around as a species. Uh, it will continue. And what you can then say is that the, the arrow of explanation or understanding of the physical world is beginning to converge with our experiences that we call psychic. And at some point they'll probably converge close enough. So we say, okay, now we understand how it happens. What it will be required is that probably something about consciousness will have to be seen as a, as a core component of the nature of reality itself. So some future version of super quantum mechanics combined with some understanding of consciousness, when that gets together, I, I would predict then that psychic phenomena will be looked at and say, well, of course that has to occur. I mean, that has to occur given the way that we now understand the nature of reality. At this point, about the best that we can do is saying there's something about notions of spirituality that are beginning to converge with science, but we're still in the infancy of understanding what's actually happening. Hmm. So a question I have as, a, as curious me, not skeptical me is, so there are people who let's say in the Eastern world to generalize have had this, these phenomena as part of their experience for not, not just decades, not, not even centuries, probably millennia and have been rigorously testing and being trained in, in certain psi phenomena along with different meditation skills and different breath work and, and lots of other things. Have you spoken to people who have gone through these processes and asked them how these phenomena work, like how, how the universe is structured to allow for these phenomena? Because what I've come across um, in my explorations is that people do actually have answers for these things. They haven't been tested in a laboratory, but they have been empirically tested, not even individually, but as, as a culture or as a group. So what, what's been your experiences if you have spoken to these people? It depends on what culture they come from. So if they're coming from Eastern culture, the, their explanations will pretty closely match the esoteric traditions that they come from. They come from a Western uh, culture and they did not have esoteric beginnings or religious beginnings. Sometimes they end up talking about with words like uh, vibration and frequencies and energies. Speak my language. Well, yeah, because that's what it feels like. But the, the problem is that you take a word like energy medicine. The energy that's being talked about is not what a physicist knows as energy. Mm -hmm. And even the medicine that's being talked about is not what is generally thought of as medicine in, in the allopathic sense. So energy medicine is, is an oxymoron. It doesn't make any sense but it makes a lot of sense from a, from a subjective perspective because you can feel stuff happening. You can see stuff happening, but our instruments don't pick it up. And so we, we don't know yet where, how to change these or how to measure these internal senses in a way that science requires, which is to be objective. The best we can do is use proxies, which, uh, which show effects. So we just finished a large study on energy medicine. We, st we studied 17 different modalities of energy medicine uh, and 190 clients in this study. So all of the clients had carpal tunnel pain, wrist and hand pain, just so we can use a uniform model. And the methods were shamanistic healing and psychic healing and therapeutic touch and all kinds of things like that. Uh, so the proxy I mean, we, we actually did healing on the people. So you saw that there was a significant reduction of pain, but I was more interested in the objective measure. So one of them was water. So you get laboratory grade distilled water. You put it in a little thing called an aliquot, which has a couple of mill, milliliters of water. You have them wear it around their neck, both the healer and the client. And then you measure the, the water, the, the molecular spectrum of the water before and after the healing. And the, the reason you do that is because the human body is around 70% water. And you figure that if the healer is doing something to the client, then the water might reflect that. 
Mm. So use a very fancy spectrometer to be able to measure the molecular vibration or actually the molecular structure of the water. And sure enough, it changed significantly, but only in the water that was around the, the healer's neck and not around the client. So even though the client significantly changed, it was the water around the healer's neck that actually showed us a, a measurable difference. That's that, that I was not expecting actually. I, I guess that kind of fits in with the, the whole power of intention thing, being able to heal something that's in front of you if the, the power's coming from you, but who, yeah, who knows? Yeah, so, so it's, it's, it becomes a data point, right? It's, it's, yeah, one exactly. of, it's a clue. Every time you do an experiment, the universe gives you an answer and you have to be clever enough to figure out what, what do I do with this now? So it's mm. a clue. And I, I will say that one of the things that I find the most frustrating about having to have these conversations with skeptics is that I feel the art of empiricism and individual in, in experimentation has been absolutely lost. Like the ability to be able to collate one's own data points over a lifetime of experiences and form a unique worldview based on uncertainty and curiosity. I think that has been absolutely annihilated by our kind of deifying of, of modern science. Um, so I, I know I only have a few minutes more left of your, of your time. May I ask one question for people at home? Do you have a, a, an experiment that if they wanted to try, say with their partner or their friend, or maybe by themselves, that it might be easy for them to have a go, see if they have any psychic abilities? Well, the short answer is no. Uh, I, I'm working on an app that will uh, allow for people to test themselves. Uh, and there is a, a website today that's already over 20 years now. I wrote it back in 2000, uh, which is called gotsci.org. So gotsci.org has a suite of, our, of six or so different tests that you can try yourself. They're all based on precognition. Uh, but it's it's a computer test and you there's a hall of fame and you get an instant feedback and all that and people seem to like it that sounds really fun so the reason why it, it's more it's not impossible of course but it, it's it re requires a certain degree of uh, explanation for what people should do if they want to do more than one person so mm -hmm. multiple person tests are not particularly difficult but it takes a description on how to how to actually do it and how to interpret it and all the rest um, could, and, could somebody uh, not say with their partner and get 20 meters apart, flip a coin and see if they can guess whether it's heads or tails more than chance? Sure. Yeah. Or, or even playing cards where you're probably not going to guess the card, but maybe the suit mm. or the color or something like that. So those, those are certainly possible. The, the thing is that the effects tend to be pretty weak. Like there, there's a lot of noise involved. So you'd have to keep records for a long time because you'll find among other things that the time of day matters and who you're dealing with matters and all kinds of things make a difference in these kinds of experiments. Uh, emotional closeness makes a big difference. All, all of these factors are part of the reason why it is not difficult, but it takes a lot of data in order to be able to pull a signal out of the noise, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And um, one, one last experiment, uh, just have you, have you heard, I'm sure you have heard of the, the rice experiments and what do you think of that? Yeah, so if you, if you want to see if your intention affects a living system, then uh, rice is certainly a way to do it. You, you put rice in water and you do it as, you make as many identical versions of it as you can. Uh, and then you pray over some or you give good feelings for some of the samples and either no uh, intention or negative intentions for others and just see what happens as the water evaporates and the rice will either stay fresh or at least look fresh as compared to, uh, to going bad. Yeah. So there are a lot of people who do that as a, uh, as a one-off. When we do that in the laboratory, which we've done, of course, the conditions are much more rigorous but we get kind of the same results. And we've done this with blessing chocolate, yeah, blessing tea, um, looking at plant growth, uh, a variety of things like that. And in, in all of these cases, intention does make a difference. Mm. Beautiful. Uh, so ju just to clarify, if anyone wants to try that at home, you can get say nine jars of rice. You can write love and then hate and then nothing on three individually or maybe 
the three or you can do lots of different iterations of the experiment and yep. then perhaps for five days straight just think loving thoughts into one hateful thoughts into one and nothing into another and see what happens i did it myself back in the day when i was very skeptical and it was a drastic difference between between the three of them in, in not much time and it was a data point which i had to take into consideration so thank you yeah. so much for your time that was absolutely fascinating i will definitely have a lot to be thinking about and um do you have other books so I, I i know you do but um i've only read real magic um do you have other books that you might recommend for people interested in these phenomena so for for people interested in the eastern esoteric uh ways of thinking about these phenomena then the book is super normal because mm -hmm. it, it it looks at these same kinds of things from the perspective of yoga and of course in the yogic tradition this stuff is considered completely normal and so it's useful to then see, well, how would they see it as normal? So that's mm -hmm. what that book is about. If you're interested in the physics, then the book is Entangled Minds, which is all about the, what I think is a meaningful relationship between quantum mechanical ways of thinking about reality and these phenomena. And if you're really academic and you wanna know how is it that science can reach any conclusion about these things, then the book is The Conscious Universe. Perfect. Okay, I will try and leave links to all of them in the description. Great. Perfect. I will say thank you very, very much again. And uh, yeah, I, I can only wish you the best. I think you are an innovator in, in the world of modern science. And I, I hope that a lot of people will start listening to what you have to say more and more. Thank you.